the chapter starts with MC's parents being killed by monsters, and he swears to become an adventurer. Skills is the power God gave humans so they could retaliate against the monsters. Skills are revealed to humans before they turn 12 but exactly when that happens varies from person to person. Amongst all the adventurers, the S rank stands at the pinnacle with the power of an army thanks to their skills. As a young boy, the MC yearns to accomplish heroic deeds like those we hear in fairy tales. The MC prays to God to give him the power to rid the world of evil, even if only a little, but those thoughts betrayed him. A skill window pops up in front of him. He runs to a priest and tells him he finally got his skill. The priest tells Chrome that with a skill like this, it might be difficult for him to become an adventurer. A guy named Arthur tells Chrome to walk properly, and Chrome apologizes, saying he's sorry. Arthur tells him they were generous to hire a skillless person like him, so he shouldn't piss them off. Chrome says his skill is revival, but he can only come back to life once. For adventurers, skills are their most important weapon, a skill that can only save you from. Once is of little use to an adventurer. He also says that he's living as third rate, adventurer doing the only work he's capable of which are odd jobs. It may only be as a laughable third rate adventurer, but he is still proud of doing his part in protecting his country cause Arthur's little sister has a magic skill but refuses to party up with him. The other guy says, of course, she would, and Chrome laughs immediately after they are attacked by monsters. Arthur and the other guy uses their skills flame cloak and Herculean strength to defeat it and said it was easy and only cunning imps are a bit of a pain when they are running around. Arthur asks Chrome to get the magic stones, Chrome says they are off the map and they need to hurry back. Arthur tells him not to tell him what to do or he will smack him before he can finish his sentence. Lots of bugbears appeared out of the shadows. Arthur says the imps led the bugbears right to them and they start fighting, but there are too many of them. Arthur thinks that they are tough and there are too many, and to top it all off, they are known for their voracious appetite. Arthur pushes Chrome towards the bugbears and says it is better he dies than all of them dying, and that he has the revival skill too. Chrome thinks that even though he has the revival skill but there is no way he's going to make it out from this depth all by himself. The bugbears bite him, and it hurts, then he thinks he can't die in a place like this. Chrome's revival skill is activated. Chrome thinks he's alive, so revival brought him safely back to life. But what will he do being so far in? Chrome looks at his and sees only bones. He then looks at himself through his sword and wonders why in the world does he look like a skeleton. He also realizes he can't speak. He wonders if it is a dream and decides to check his status. His status are level of 5th, HP 7 over 7, MP 1 over 1, rank E, attack 3, defense 2, magic 1, speed 2, and unobtained. Chrome says he's no longer level 9, and it calls him a white. A white is a resurrected monster with evil mans within its bones. It's tough for an E-rank adventurer, but it's weak and has no intelligence. It is nothing but a wandering corpse. Chrome thinks not to mess with him that he has a head that can think. And everything he remembers the priest telling him they have no record of his skill. And that if it works, it's not suited for an adventurer. Chrome says he didn't know the details since it was a rare skill. And did this happen because of the damage to his body? Or maybe the dungeon's mana? He thinks that it doesn't matter now. Having a body like this is practically a death sentence. Well, he actually did die though it wasn't a very good life. He wanted to protect his country, and all he got was a defective skill, despite risking his life every day he was just made fun of all the time. He says it's frustrating, but he guess his sister was right. Only the people who had powerful skills could end up as high-ranking adventurers in the first place. He knew that he knew that well and yet. Chrome says no, that's wrong, and that monsters can evolve if they gain levels and gain more skills, if he keeps evolving and obtaining skills, he might return to looking like a human being again, someday, and if that's the case, he might become the S rank adventurer he had given up on becoming so long ago, but whites are terribly weak monsters and wonders if he can really do it and then he realizes he's no a normal monster because he can think, he says, it's his only hope so it's worth trying. It wasn't difficult for Chrome to slip past the monsters. Thanks to him being a skeleton, he gathered information about the terrain, what monsters look weak, and what other advantages he can find. He finds a level 4 goblin and kills it, saying his decoy worked. He gains 3 XP and levels up from 1 to 3. He says that he defeated a monster that is higher than him in level, so he can do this with this body and his human intelligence once he reaches the white's maximum level of 5 he should be able. To evolve, he has already died once so he has to level up like his life depends on it. Chrome kills a level 1 goblin slug and receives 1 XP. He says he has hit his limit of avoiding. 
the strong and hunting the weak and says he really needs to go for some stronger enemies. He might evolve if he just kept going on like this, but it might take decades. He thinks that he needs neither rest nor food, but he feels like he can easily forget what it's like to be human if he's constantly awake while it's definitely convenient not having to eat. It might be because he's in a dungeon where there's no sun, but he has lost all sense of time. He thinks it hasn't been a week yet, right? Three, maybe two days. Who knows, maybe it hasn't been half a day yet. Chrome thinks his little sister must be worried, right? Well, he has been away for days at a time before, so maybe she hasn't even noticed. Even if she did notice, she's probably not worried at all. He tells himself to stop, and he says it's the dungeon's fault he's getting all negative and he can't stay there forever so he will have to pick some fight if he wants to get stronger. A level 7 red eye passes by Chrome and he thinks that if he defeated he will level up right away but it's far stronger and more faster than him and he wonders if someone like him can really defeat it. He stays confident and says he's a monster with human intelligence after all he just needs to put his advantage to use as much as he can. Luckily with his body he can easily pretend to be dead so he has been able to safely investigate the dungeon and his targets. He says where he is, is a red eye territory so in that case he pretends to be dead so when the red eye came to check his bag he jumps up and stabs it from behind saying he knew it would come and check for food if there was a dead body and luggage. He says his body is just bones but that lightness is its strongest point against a stronger opponent he will use any trick in the book. As Chrome pulls out his sword from the red eye it bites his arm pulling it off Chrome. Stabs it again saying he won't be defeated and finally kills the red eye he says he won but just barely. Chrome gains 11 XP and levels up from 3 to 5. He says he finally did it. His skill window shows a message saying White has reached the level cap evolution. Condition fulfilled. Chrome says to think he could raise his level this much in just as few days setting aside the appearance. He really has to praise his strong monster body. And he sort of instinctively understand how to evolve. Evolution starts to occur and Chrome begs to look more human. But S message pops up in front of him telling him he has evolved into the ghoul. The deceased, who had turned into a monster, has now taken the form of a corpse-eating demon. It has vicious claws and fangs, but its regeneration is its most fearsome feature. Chrome thinks a ghoul is a little misshapen, but he looks more human-like than before. His hand also went back to normal, too, and he wonders if that is also thanks to the perks of evolution. His stats are now level 5 10th, HP 22 over 22, MP 6 over 6, rank D, attack 9, defense 5, magic 5, speed 5, regeneration. Chrome is happy his stats increased, and he even got a skill regeneration. This might be the strong skill he was hoping for, even though it was not what he wanted to turn into a monster. A ghoul's level cap is 20 Chrome says he will be able to evolve again once he gets there. He says it is kind of fun, and he doesn't really have any other option anyways. Leveling up and evolving so that he can return to a human form and become the strongest adventurer. Chrome is fighting a level 5 monster rat but the ghoul's claws gets in the way, making it hard to use a sword. He gets hit in the chest by the rat, so he throws his sword at the rat and uses his claws to attack it and kills it saying a weapon just gets in the way with these. Hands he gains 7 XP and levels up from 5 to 6 he says the next evolution is at level 20. It seems so far away. He regenerates his injuries and says a ghoul's body is convenient and all, but he gets terribly hungry. He eats the rat and says he's becoming more and more like a monster, but he says no that his current lifestyle feels more human-like compared to when he was a white so there's no doubt he's closer to being human now. A few days later, Chrome is fighting a level 14 orc and defeats it, gaining 33 XP, and he levels up from 13 to 14, and he says he's leveling up at a good pace. He says he can risk a lot thanks to regeneration and it's also great that he doesn't feel any fatigue thanks to being an undead only 6 more levels to go before he can evolve. He may be taking risks, but it's still unbelievably fast. He's already stronger than his old self, and he says he just hopes he becomes more human in his next evolution. Chrome thinks of his little sister and wonders what she's doing. He says he used to get along with Kamiya a long time ago, but she's barely spoken to him these past few years. Because of his skill, he couldn't properly work as an adventurer and didn't earn much so it was rough saving up enough to support Kamiya, but unlike him, it turned out Kamiya had a magic skill which was suited for an adventurer. Chrome remembers a conversation he had with Kamiya where he tells her she has become a C-rank adventurer, but he's still stuck at rank D. But Kamiya tells him it's stupid for a weakling like him to be so set on 
becoming an adventurer and asks him why doesn't just stop if he doesn't have the talent. For it, a useless older brother and a talented younger sister, she started looking down on him as she began working as an adventurer. They spoke less and less, and he ended up avoiding going home because it was so awkward. Chrome thinks since so much time has passed, Kamiya might be wondering what happened to him by now, or maybe not. She was really indifferent to him. If he returns home like this, he was sure he and get exterminated, and he still couldn't speak yet either. Chrome hears sounds and wonders if it is a goblin, but they are people, and that's not all Kamiya is there. He thinks the dungeon is close to town, but to think they and run into each other. Chrome knowing he will get killed if they find him tries to get away before they find him. Kamiya speaks to her men, asking what do they mean by they've run out of salve. A guy wearing a cloak says he didn't know they'd use that much, and a girl with pink hair says they couldn't check how much they had left easily since the bags are opaque. Kamiya tells them this is the basics and what they are gonna do if they get bitten by a monster. But the girl replies, saying it's not that bad and that they deal with most wounds by just cleaning them and drinking a potion. Kamiya asks them if they can trust someone who didn't take preparations seriously to have their back, and they reply by saying they are the ones who agreed to help her on short notice. Kamiya tells them they are responsible for agreeing and that there are no excuses when they are risking their lives. Chrome, who still hasn't left yet, says she's the same even in the dungeon and thinks she doesn't need to be so harsh about it even though she's right. Chrome mistakenly scratches the wall with his claws making Kamiya, and the others notice him. Kamiya attacks Chrome with her ice magic skill, Ice Arrow, which hits him in the hand. The guy says it's to a ghoul, and the girl says they are not strong, but they are tough. Chrome says oh no, knowing he's in a bad situation. Chrome says the adventurers found him, and it had to be Kamiya of all people. Lena says ghouls have a healing skill, and Derek says they just have to crush it in one go. But Kamiya tells them if they rush at it, they're bound to get hurt. Crushing it in one go is only standard practice after they've cornered it with safe attacks. Chrome thinks he's not even sure he will make it through even if it's just one-on-one -on -one and she's level 18. He says Kamiya got really strong, and he needs to find an opportunity to run away. Derek says he will smash it with his skill and attacks Chrome with a scorching slash, a skill that cloaks his weapon in flames. Lena attacks with a light body, which makes her very fast. She hits Chrome with her sword, but he blocks it with his arm. Chrome thinks that he can't. Take even a single hit from Derek and he will give him a chance if he doesn't dodge Lena's. Attacks correctly, but he can't do anything but dodge, with this difference in both people. And levels it's impossible for him to just run away. Chrome thinks he doesn't want to attack humans, but he's not a normal monster. He has to use his head. Chrome kicks a stone at Derek, but he blocks it with his sword, which doesn't let him see. Chrome getting close to him. Chrome hits him in the face with his elbow and thinks that. He can't use his claws after all and runs away, knowing that chasing monsters deep into. The dungeon is banned so they shouldn't follow him if he got far enough, but Lena chases. After him saying she won't let him go, Chrome thinks that he will be in trouble if she overtakes him and decides he has no choice but to face her when she catches up to him. He stops and faces her knowing he has regeneration he can't take few of her hits. Lena attacks Chrome, but he blocks it all with his arm and hits her sword into the wall. Chrome thinks he took her by surprise since she wouldn't expect an undead to plan anything after all. Kamiya shoots ice arrows at Chrome's feet, which makes him fall face down. Lena says it's as expected of the ice princess Kamiya. Derek says he wanted to kill it himself to level up, though, but Kamiya tells him he was too aggressive. If he had just kept it in check, she could have finished it with her ice magic easily. Chrome thinks that he's going to get killed at this rate and realizes he can't get up, never mind his shins. His thighs are completely gouged out, what absurd firepower. Chrome thinks it's okay since he has the skills of ghoul regeneration and says even with his wounds, he can run again in just a minute, but he doesn't have a whole minute as Kamiya prepares to attack him with ice lance. Chrome thinks he's going to get killed by his little sister. Chrome can't dodge because of his wounded legs, and jumping at Kamiya to try and scare her and break her spell won't work either. He starts thinking of what to do if he can. Just do something about Kamiya's spell, his regeneration will have enough time, he tries, calling her name, and all he can say is, Carlermi, which makes her stop and miss, Derek, asks Kamiya what she's doing missing at point-blank range, Chrome thinks that was close, he would have been a goner if Kamiya's ice spear had hit him, Chrome thinks that his plan to shake her up by calling her name worked, although just barely, Chrome's regeneration is done, and he stands up and scares Kamiya before she can use her ice magic which makes her fall, and Chrome runs away. Kamiya realizes she fell for a feint and was tricked by a monster. Derek asks Kamiya what she's doing, letting the ghoul get away. 
Kamiya thinks that the undead is a type of monster created by the dungeon's mana filling human corpses, so she must have misheard it right. Chrome, after getting away from the adventurers, thinks that it was close since he is about to get killed back there. To think he and get cornered by three high-level adventurers, but it is really nice to have an easy-to-use skill, and he thanks his regeneration and says he needs to watch out for adventurers while looking for monsters. Chrome thinks that it has been a long time since he last saw his sister in a dungeon, not since he went in with her the first few times to show her the ropes. Even though she ended up surpassing his level right away, he thinks he can't run into them again and sees they are heading the other way, and he says he will be fine if he heads in the opposite direction. He then realizes they are headed to the deep part of the dungeon and wonders if she plans on going in deeper. Chrome says normal people can't stay in the dungeon for long. Not only do they get tired both physically and mentally, but there's another reason. The thick mana in dungeons is dangerous to humans, it gnaws away at you the longer you stay. When humans enter dungeons they need strategies with a large margin for error so it would be dangerous for people their level to go any further. They have. Chrome thinks he really might get killed if he gets found out again, but he will follow them from a distance. Kamiya, Derek, and Lena find an adventurer's corpse. Derek says he has already been stripped of anything valuable, and Lena says it's disgraceful Kamiya says they should keep. On moving, Derek asks if they are still continuing, and Lena says, isn't it too dangerous? And Kamiya replies saying she has been exploring this far countless times before and that with their skills and levels, it should be no issue if they just cooperate, they shouldn't rush in, like they did earlier and it will be fine. Derek thinks he has to play second fiddle to her, and that's coming from someone who messed up too. Chrome sees that they are going in further and says the strong monsters are found much further in since they like the dense mana, although they are fickle and there's exceptions. In a dungeon, you always need to be prepared for the unexpected and must move carefully. Chrome thinks that all this while he thinks Kamiya is the rational type and wonders what she's in such a rush for. Kamiya and the other adventurers are suddenly attacked by a level 22 ogre. Chrome says he knew this would happen. An irregular monsters above level 20 are supposed to only be in the deepest part of the dungeon. Chrome wonders what Kamiya will do. With this level difference, they will have casualties if they mess up while running away. Chrome thinks that he can jump out and distract it. He then realizes he can't because they think he's nothing but a monster. They will just think they are surrounded and panic and he can only watch over them for now. Derek asks what they are gonna do and says this is exactly why he said they should pull back. Kamiya says with her magic, she can even damage an ogre and that it shouldn't be undefeatable as long as they cooperate. Derek wonders if they can beat such a terrifying monster, but if he runs away now with how low his level is, it will catch and kill him for sure, so they have to try. Derek unleashes his scorching slash skill but gets hit away before he can do anything, and he falls, thinking the monster's reach is too huge. Lena uses his light body to get behind the ogre, but she also reacts to her movements which surprises her, and he hits her away with Derek screaming her name. She says it only grazed her, but it sent her flying. What crazy strength. Kamiya shoots ice arrows at the ogre, but it blocks them, and the only one that hits him can't penetrate his skin. Kamiya says it's too tough, and she cannot beat it with her ice arrows. Chrome thinks their situation isn't looking good, they don't have enough levels, and their coordination is shallow, why would an impromptu party even come this deep inside? Kamiya thinks she has no choice but to use the more powerful ice lance, even if it doesn't. Outright defeated, she's sure they will find some way through, but it takes a long time. Before she can shoot the spell, she needs the other two to create an even bigger opportunity for her than they just did. Derek thinks it's no use. They are just not high-leveled enough, they're short on speed, power, and magic. And at this rate, he's really going to die. Kamiya tells them to attack the ogre and attract its attention. If they drag the fight out for too long, they will have no chance of winning. Kamiya thinks that she can't die in a place like this and that they still have a chance. Derek thinks that she's really telling them to attack this terrifying monster. Easy for her to say, being safe in the rear guard like that, and if he just runs away, the ogre will catch him with how low his level is, so he has no choice but to listen to Kamiya. Derek whispers something in Lena's ear, with Chrome wondering what they are saying. The ogre attacks them with Kamiya thinking she would like them to lure the ogre a little closer, but she guesses that's impossible with how scared they are, and decides she has no choice but to risk it all on her ice lance hitting. Derek thinks it's time and shouts Lena's name. Lena then uses her light body skill to grab Derek and runs away with Lena telling Kamiya not to think ill of them. Chrome realizes they are leaving Kamiya at the most crucial moment. Kamiya shoots her ice lance at the ogre, but it only hits it in the arm, and the ogre hits Kamiya with its club, 
which makes Chrome rush out from where he's hiding. Derek says it's all Kamiya's fault, to begin with, for wanting to dive this deep on short notice trying to find her brother who disappeared in the dungeon and says when the low-rank adventurers disappear, they are, of course, gonna be dead. Kamiya asks why did Chrome have to be so reckless when he was so weak and asks where he go calling him an idiot brother, and she passes out. The ogre tries to kill Kamiya, but Chrome hits its hand and says he's sorry for hiding from Kamiya. He then faces the ogre and tells it he's its new opponent. The ogre attacks Chrome, but he dodges and thinks that in terms of levels, he's far behind. But the ogre is one arm down, and most importantly, Kamiya's life depends on him, so losing is not an option. He attacks the ogre slashing his torso, and picks up one of Kamiya's ice arrows and throws it at the ogre and then attacks it, but it hits him with its club breaking his arm. Chrome says he thought he would be able to manage if he could attack from its left where it's missing an arm, but it turns out it won't change that easily. Chrome says the monster may be armed, but its speed, power, and reach are all monstrous. If he wants to slip past it and deliver the final blow, he can't just keep trying for its blind spot. He has to get it to give a more decisive opening. No matter how much it tries, its attacks are predictable as long as it uses only one arm, it's possible to dodge its attacks if he just focuses on it. His stamina might not be endless either, but swinging around that much is bound to be exhausting too. The ogre gets tired, and Chrome attacks it saying he may be rotten. He's still human, and he won't lose in terms of patience. Chrome thinks that the only closest weapon to the ogre who has lost its arm are his fangs, and he trusts that it is going to come flying at him. With them if he riles it up, the ogre comes rushing towards it with its fangs and bites. Chrome's left hand which gave Chrome a chance to bite its neck which kills the ogre. Chrome gains 128 XP and levels up from 14 to 18. Chrome says he somehow won and regenerates his arm and thinks to himself that his regeneration skill is very useful. As long as he doesn't die, he can regenerate. Chrome says sorry and thanks Kamiya and thinks that it's not that she looked down on him but that she was worried for him, who kept clinging to being an adventurer even though he couldn't really protect himself. Chrome carries Kamiya on his back and thinks of what to do to stop Kamiya from coming back to the dungeon. As he is carrying her out, he finds the sword he threw away. Chrome pretends to attack Kamiya and two guys come to save her while Chrome runs away. Kamiya wakes up and asks where she is, the guys tell her she was unconscious and was being attacked by a ghoul. A ghoul she wonders what happened to the ogre and says she feels like someone rescued and carried her away, and it felt nostalgic, but that's impossible. The guys ask Kamiya if the sword belongs to her. She looks at the sword and realizes it's her brother's, and I will come back for sure, just wait is written on the sword, she shouts, brother, and cries. Chrome says goodbye to Kamiya and that they will see again just two more levels before he can evolve again and says he's sure he will look like a human then. Chrome chases after some level 14 bugbears and kills them, giving him 15 XP. He then eats them and says they don't taste very good. Their tentacles are like rubber, their skin is hard like metal, and their innards feel like rotten guts too. He says he died getting eaten by bugbears right and wonders if bugbears eat humans ass. Well, he says he hates the fact that he can't stop himself from eating things like that after becoming a ghoul. He'd never have thought that he and be the one to eat those guys after being utterly overwhelmed by them for so long. Normal monsters would never challenge stronger ones since humans can't stay in the dungeon for long. He says he got to level 18 fast and should have gotten a lot closer to being human by going from white to a ghoul. He might even be able to enter the town after his next evolution. Well there's no use worrying since he really can't do anything to change it. He might only be two levels away, but he's probably still far away from his next evolution. Chrome says he can't expect any big level ups if he doesn't fight monsters stronger than him, but he in love to avoid fighting something like that ogre again. He says this isn't the deep part of the dungeon where he encountered the ogre, but just taking his time and hunting weaker guys should be fine. Someone sneaks up from behind Chrome and attacks him with a sword, but he avoids it, saying that it was close and what a crazy power. He then discovers it's a level 21 gargoyle. It attacks him again, and Chrome thinks that monsters above level 20 should not be. Around there, the gargoyle shoots fire from its mouth at Chrome which burns his hand. He then attacks him with its sword, which cuts him a little before he can avoid it. Chrome says he barely dodged the sword and that its elbow strike was unexpectedly powerful. It spews flame at him and flies at him, so he can't hear it either. Chrome says he only won against the ogre because Kamiya's spell took off its arm. His level has gone up, but he has no chance of winning against it, so he runs away. The gargoyle chases after him, and just as it catches up with him Chrome hits it in the face, but it doesn't even leave a scratch. 
Chrome says that both its level and skill are too much for him to handle and keeps running away. But there's only a cliff ahead. The gargoyle spews flame at Chrome and flies towards him. But Chrome avoids it, and it flies over the cliff with Chrome jumping after it and hits it very hard. Chrome somehow wins, gaining 108 XP, and he moves from level 18 to 20. Chrome thanks the gargoyle calling it Mr. Fall Damage and saying he couldn't have won fighting normally. A message pops up in front of him telling him the ghoul has reached the level cap and the evolution condition is fulfilled. Chrome says it's finally time and says it was an unexpectedly strong opponent. But thanks to that, he reached his target and says the first thing he wants to do after evolving is check his appearance and pray he becomes something closer to human. Evolution occurs, and Chrome turns into a shapeshifter. His stats are now level 2050th, HP 4879th, MP 926th, rank C. Chrome evolves into a shapeshifter and suddenly becomes a lot bigger, he has a mask on his face, and he can't take it off, but he is a higher rank monster than a ghoul, it is said that evolution brings monsters closer to their ideal powers. Chrome strongly wishes to be human, but he is an utter and complete monster no matter where you look. A shapeshifter is an undead monster that imitates the form of the living to attack them. It is said that those who see its true form never return alive. Chrome says it's a much more terrifying monster than a ghoul. He checks his status, which is level 2050th, HP 4879th, MP 926th, rank C, attack 33, defense 19, magic 24, speed 26, regeneration and masquerade. Chrome says the stats are so much higher than a ghoul's, and a C-rank monster is quite threatening. It's something a party of mid-rank adventurers can barely defeat. Chrome wonders if he can get into a human with his masquerade skill. He activates his masquerade skill, and the mask begins to float. He looks at himself in the water, and he has transformed back into his human self, and his voice though a bit hoarse, works as well. Chrome says he could pass for a human if he just hides a bit of his face, but he feels a sensation of his power being drained. He discovers that Masquerade allows him to take human form temporarily and consumes 1 MP every 10 minutes. Chrome says his max MP is 26 meaning he can only transform up to 4 hours or so at once, and says it will be tough living in the city like that, but there's still hope he can just level up to increase his MP and he thinks that he expects a lot from his next evolution. Everywhere shakes, making Chrome wonder if it is an earthquake, but it settles down. Chrome wonders what happened and thinks it might be a dungeon disaster. They say deep below the earth lies the corpse of gigantic monsters, the peculiar space resulting from the evil men which comes out from their bodies that's the dungeon. If left alone and allowed to accumulate mana for a long time, it results in an outburst of unnatural phenomena. That's what a dungeon disaster is. Chrome wonders if C-rank monsters appearing around was a sign of that. But he says with only those few cases, it will be hard to come to a conclusion. Chrome is attacked by a level 20 gargoyle and says it doesn't look like it will be hasty after all. Chrome says to him, can't attack since he has no claws and throws a rock at the gargoyle's head. He thinks that he can't muster up any strength thanks to being in his human form. The gargoyle spews flame at him and flies towards him. He dodges and says he knew it was going to charge at him with its stone body. And Chrome attacks back, killing the gargoyle and giving him 90 XP. Chrome says luckily, he could charge through the flames thanks to regeneration. But to think he could take out the gargoyle that had him running for his life so easily, he might even be able to beat an ogre alone now. Monsters are powerful, but their lack of intelligence is their weak point, Chrome doesn't have that weakness. He also has resistance to the dungeon's mana and doesn't even feel tired. Maybe he's closer to the next evolution than he thought. He won't be anything to fear no matter how many gargoyles come at him now. Chrome encounters three gargoyles and runs away, saying that many are still impossible for him. Chrome says it's clear that the rate of the monsters appearing is getting higher something undoubtedly must have happened in the dungeon. Chrome defeats a gargoyle, gains 90 XP, and levels up from 20 to 21. Chrome says shapeshifters are strong, to think he can dispose of the gargoyles he struggled so much against as a ghoul so easily. Chrome notices he has a scratch on his arm and regenerates. He says he has excellent physical abilities, claws, and fangs, high endurance, and multiple skills. A monster's body is crazy stronger than humans. He says his next evolution is at 50, but it might happen sooner than he thinks. For C-rank monsters to appear in such great numbers when there are only supposed to be D-rank monsters around here, Chrome says it must be a dungeon disaster and that the ogre that appeared in such a shallow area was probably also a sign of that. Once the dungeon disaster starts, high-level monsters will
appear in great numbers, they will crawl outside and start wreaking havoc in the surrounding area. And the only way to stop a dungeon disaster is to beat the heart of the dungeon, its boss. Chrome says it's quite troublesome, and he doesn't have an idea what will happen if the dungeon disaster continues. Chrome hears footsteps and thinks maybe there are monsters, but realizes they are humans. One of the humans named Frank says with all of the earthquakes earlier, and all the gargoyles around, he's sure a dungeon disaster is coming. Another guy named Guido says what awful timing and says he guesses they have to go back to the guild and report it. A girl named Shelly says what Guido is saying. Instead, they should defeat the boss before there are any victims. Chrome, from where he's hiding, thinks that he messed up. He should have just run away. He says their level is a little higher, more even than Kamiya's party, and he will be in quite a pickle if they get into a fight. Guido asks why they should take such a huge risk. Frank replies, saying dungeon disasters get out of hand as time passes, and there's no doubt they have a good chance since they discovered it early. Guido asks if they are saying they should fight him. That they are being too naive, he tells them that if there is dungeon disaster, the boss level rises and it changes form, so it's simply too reckless to challenge the lord of the dungeon. With no information whatsoever, Frank says so that he's sure he can sell the boss magic, stone for a fortune. Frank also tells them that if the area becomes a monster nest, it will have a huge negative impact on commerce, so the damage is much greater than they think. It's not just from the monster attacks, unemployment and starvation are sure to follow as well, and they are adventurers, rising to the challenge to defend the people in. The city is what they do. Guido replies, saying he still doesn't see why they need to take on such a risk. Frank says it seems like a dungeon disaster was the leading cause of Shelley's hometown falling to ruin. But Shelley doesn't reply. Chrome thinks that he is the same as him or worse since his town got rebuilt. Frank tells them that naturally, since the risk to their lives will be great, he can't force them or anything. Going back and making sure they know is also an important duty. Guido notices Chrome and shoots an arrow at him. Chrome thinks that he is hiding, but they still find him. Guido says his skill eye of Artemis gave him a response, so he knew something was wrong. Chrome thinks that it's too dangerous to just try and run away now, so he has to try that Frank says they will give him three seconds, so he should come out if he understands. Frank pulls out his sword, and Chrome quickly uses his masquerade skill and stands up, saying he's just an adventurer. Frank says oh, he's a human and says he's sorry about that. Guido asks him why he was sneaking around, and Chrome tells him he didn't know if they were adventurers or bandits. And even if they weren't bandits, meeting with someone in the dungeon usually only leads to trouble. Guido thinks that Chrome is s weird guy, and he's much more on guard than he needs to be. Worst of all, he feels so ominous. Guido wonders if he should shoot him. Frank thinks that he's in tatters and so blatantly wary of them that he doesn't seem like he's a normal adventurer in any case. Chrome says to himself that he thought he might be able to trick them in his human form. But it doesn't feel like the situation changed for the better. Derek Dean reflects on his use of the masquerade ability to alter his appearance, acknowledging it as a deceptive move on his part. Meanwhile, Guido readies his bow, displaying signs of frustration. Frank apologizes to Derek for the behavior of another individual and asks him to disregard it. Derek contemplates his surroundings, noting that he believes himself to be in the middle layers of the cave. He questions the other person's preparedness, remarking on their lack of a weapon, which he sees as a test of their skills. Observing the dirtiness of his clothes, it appears he has been underground for at least a day. Questions arise, is he alone? Where is his weapon? What level is he? While they may be assessing him covertly, his suspicions are glaringly evident. Although a certain level of distrust is expected in adventurers, Guido's demeanor exhibits it excessively. The situation is precarious, if they delve too deeply, a misstep on his part could lead to an attack at any moment. In the worst case scenario, preemptive action to intimidate them and make a swift escape may be necessary, instilling fear within the entire group. Derek and Frank exchanged a tense glance, with Frank pondering his options. Meanwhile, Shelley turned to Derek urgently, expressing concern about a dungeon disaster unfolding. Derek responded nervously, wondering if she had no suspicions about him whatsoever. Guido intervened, cautioning Shelley against being so reckless, suggesting that the man could potentially be a bandit. However, Shelley simply smiled and reassured them, stating that he wasn't a bad person, and that she could tell just by looking at him. Guido chuckled wryly, referring to him as a damn happy-go-lucky idiot. 
Shelley turned to Derek, inquiring if he had ventured into the area alone or if he had companions with him. Derek's expression soured at Guido's response, prompting him to turn and look at him. Meanwhile, Shelley maintained a friendly demeanor, offering Derek assistance in getting out if he was in trouble. However, Derek swiftly retreated, insisting that he was fine. Guido prepared to take action, but Frank intervened, advising against shooting. Shelley expressed concern for Derek's well-being, expressing hope that he was safe. Guido dismissed her comment with frustration, suggesting that they wouldn't assist a suspicious individual in leaving the area. Shelley, feeling a bit upset, spoke up, expressing her disagreement. You don't have to be so mean, he might have seemed a bit strange, but there's no way he was a bad person. And if we leave him alone, he might die in the disaster. Frank interjected, asserting his opinion. He was very suspicious. I think he's most likely an exiled criminal, and even if he doesn't attack us, being wary of him will just end in us fighting. Shelley clenched her fist, reiterating her belief. Derek doesn't seem like a bad person. Frank contemplated to himself that engaging in fights with other individuals within the dungeon posed a significant risk to everyone involved. While Derek may indeed be a criminal, there was no necessity to pursue him if he chose to flee independently. Guido's demeanor likely heightened Derek's fear of them unnecessarily. Frank glanced over at Shelley, reflecting on the perilous circumstances they had faced. Neither of them could take decisive action in that moment. However, Shelley's kindness and compassion towards Derek allowed him to escape. It was her ability to diffuse the tension that enabled them to part ways without any further conflict. With a smile and his finger under his chin, Frank acknowledged that being suspicious and maintaining a level head were valuable traits for an adventurer. However, he recognized Shelley's trust in people as a virtue. He suggested to the group to forget about Derek for now and asked Guido for his decision on their next move. Guido contemplated the situation and agreed that dealing with the issue immediately might be the best course of action. He reasoned that as the rearguard, he could always retreat if necessary. Shelley smiled and called out Guido's name in agreement. Frank playfully hugged Guido from behind, eliciting a scowl from him. With a laugh, Frank teased Guido about his serious demeanor. Guido responded in kind, exchanging banter with Frank. Shelley smiled at the exchange and reassured them both that everything would be fine, emphasizing their status as one of the top parties in the guild. She clenched her fist with determination and suggested they proceed as usual, working together to swiftly defeat their adversaries. In her thoughts, Shelley reflected on the dungeon disaster, vowing to prevent such tragedies from occurring again as long as she had the ability to do so. After some time passes, Derek finds himself exhausted, clutching his knees and taking deep breaths. Reflecting on his recent actions, he acknowledges that he ended up fleeing from the situation, feeling as though he came across as suspicious. He wonders if anyone is chasing after him and adjusts the mask hanging on the right side of his face. Derek's thoughts drift to a past encounter with Shelley, where she expressed concern for his well-being and offered assistance. He muses to himself about the rarity of such kindness, particularly since becoming undead about a week ago. Recalling his party members' chilly attitudes towards him, he questions whether they are truly prepared to face the dungeon boss. They did appear to be a formidable party, but Derek finds himself disinterested in their dungeon run. Holding his head in his hands, he considers it futile to worry about them and reflects on his recent encounter with them. Seating himself on the ground and covering his face with his hand, he contemplates their confidence and how they may view him. Examining his hand, he notes his human form and acknowledges his inability to reveal his true nature, which leaves him feeling powerless. Derek ponders Frank's words about adventurers rising to defend the people in the city, contemplating the significance of their roles. Meanwhile, the trio group, including Guido charging his bow, prepares for a formidable challenge ahead. Guido, sensing the intensity of the situation, surmises that the individual they're facing is the dungeon boss. Frank cautions the group not to lower their guard, as they are likely to encounter a monster stronger than any they've faced before. 
As the trio faces the monstrous dungeon boss, they observe its formidable appearance. A creature resembling a Godzilla with two wings, glowing red eyes, and razor-sharp teeth. Identified as the Gargoyle King, its level is a daunting 30, boasting 152 hit points and a magical power of 56. Classified as a rank C monster, the Gargoyle King emits a menacing growl, signaling its readiness to unleash its formidable might upon the trio. The trio readies themselves for the impending battle, stealing their resolve to confront this powerful adversary. Shelley's shock at the monster's level being higher than anticipated is evident as she realizes it's too late to retreat. Frank takes charge, assigning roles for the impending battle. He positions himself at the front to confront the monster head-on while directing Shelley to flank from the side. Understanding the importance of avoiding a prolonged fight with such a formidable opponent, Frank emphasizes the need to give it their all from the start. With determination, Frank readies his sword, the blue energy crackling around it as he unleashes a sword wave towards the monster. However, to his astonishment, the monster effortlessly blocks the attack, showcasing its incredible strength. Undeterred, Frank presses on, lunging towards the monster with the intent to strike. Yet, despite his best efforts, the monster's tough skin proves impenetrable, leaving Frank stunned by the lack of effect his strike had. As the monster attempts to launch an attack at Shelley, she swiftly dodges it with ease. Despite being taken aback by the monster's level, she remains undaunted, confident in her own abilities. Determined not to be outmatched in combat, Shelley reaffirms her resolve. Suddenly, a message appears on her screen, indicating the activation of a skill called Sword Princess, awakening her latent talent for swordsmanship. Shelley, determined to make an impact, swings her sword at the monster, only to find that her attack seems ineffective against its tough hide. Even Guido's arrow, aimed with precision, fails to penetrate the monster's defenses, leaving him frustrated at their inability to inflict damage. Observing the towering monster before him, Frank ponders its characteristics. Despite its formidable defense, he realizes that the eyes might be a vulnerable spot. However, the monster's two swords pose a significant obstacle, making it difficult to execute such a plan. As the monster strikes at Frank with its sword, he defends against the attack with his own weapon. Amidst the clash, Frank's mind races, searching for a strategy to overcome the formidable foe. Suddenly, a red aura emerges from the ground, catching him off guard as he realizes that the monster possesses magic abilities as well. As the monster activates its skill, enveloping the arena in a swirling vortex of red smoke, Frank finds himself struggling with injuries to both of his hands. Despite the pain and the dire situation, he casts a quick glance at Shelley, reassured that she appears to be safe. However, he senses her loss of hope, adding to the weight of the situation. Determined to maintain leadership and rally his team, Frank grips his sword tightly, resolving to press on despite the seemingly insurmountable odds. He knows that giving up now could spell disaster for them all, so he urges himself and his companions to keep attacking, no matter how futile it may seem. As Frank unleashes a powerful sword beam towards the monster, Shelley watches in awe at his impressive skills. The monster, caught off guard by the sudden onslaught, is visibly shocked. Seizing the opportunity, Frank follows up with a swift cross slash, aiming to exploit any weakness in the monster's defenses. Urging Guido into action, Frank calls for an arrow strike, directing Guido to target the monster's eye. With precision, Guido's arrow finds its mark, piercing the vulnerable spot in the monster's stomach. As Frank finds himself knocked back by the retaliatory strike from the monster, Guido urgently warns Shelley of the danger. With Frank incapacitated and the monster poised to deliver a finishing blow, Shelley shouts Frank's name in a desperate attempt to divert the monster's attention. Despite Shelley's cries, Frank remains grounded, vulnerable to the impending attack. Guido's frustration boils over as he berates Shelley, calling her a fucking idiot for their predicament. Shelley, kneeling beside Frank, desperately considers her options, realizing the impossibility of carrying Frank while engaging in combat. With gritted teeth, she expresses remorse to Guido, acknowledging that their choices have cornered him as well. 
Despite her anger and regret, she still hopes for a way out, even if it means Guido can escape. Exhausted and defiant, Guido responds to Shelley's remorse by asserting his autonomy, insisting that he made the decision to stay and fight independently. As he loses consciousness, Shelley calls out to him, but receives no response. The monster's roar fills the air, accompanied by a surge of red energy, prompting Shelley to close her eyes, bracing for what she believes is her inevitable demise. However, to her astonishment, she remains alive, spared from the monster's attack. In a dramatic turn of events, Derek emerges, wielding the monster's sword, no longer willing to cower in fear. With determination in his eyes, he curses the monster, proclaiming his intent to confront it directly. With a defiant shout, he challenges the monster, declaring his readiness to face it head-on. As Derek stands there, gripping the monster's sword, Shelley and Guido, both taken aback, question his sudden appearance. Guido, visibly surprised, asks why Derek has shown up. Derek, conflicted, ponders the potential consequences of his presence, fearing that he might only hinder their efforts and inadvertently expose his true nature. With determination surging through him, Derek clenched his fist and silenced his doubts. He realized that making excuses was futile and instead focused on taking action. Despite the doubts and mockery he faced, he resolved to do his utmost to protect others from the monster's harm. This resolve drove him forward, pushing him to embrace his role as an adventurer despite the challenges and ridicule he encountered along the way. With a surge of determination, Derek charged at the monster, disregarding the risk of revealing his true form. Despite the possibility of exposure, he knew that the lives at stake outweighed any concerns about his appearance. As he closed in on the creature, he reassured himself that his level was higher than theirs, bolstering his confidence that he could make a difference in the fight. As the clash of swords illuminated the battlefield, Derek couldn't help but notice the damage inflicted on the monster. However, despite his efforts, he couldn't shake off the feeling of overwhelming odds due to the level difference between him and the monster. In comparison to the creature, Derek, a shapeshifter, found himself at a disadvantage with his level at 21, HP at 79, and magic power at 23, all lower than that of the monster. As the monster pushed harder against Derek, he strained to hold his ground, determined not to yield. With a burst of strength, Derek managed to push the monster away. However, as he faced the creature again, he couldn't shake the feeling of the impending defeat. His gaze shifted towards Frank lying on the ground, realizing that despite his efforts, victory seemed out of reach. Derek wished they could retreat while there was still a chance, but it appeared that option was no longer available to them. Shelley, weakened and in pain, clutched her right arm, struggling to maintain her composure. Derek observed the monster, noting that despite being attacked by three adversaries, it bore barely any wounds, save for some damage to the head and the eye on its stomach. As Derek stared at the formidable monster, he realized its resilience. Determined to defeat it, he braced himself for the challenge. Suddenly, the monster struck, sending Derek reeling backward. Shelley watched in horror as Derek took a nasty cut from the monster's attack. Meanwhile, Guido, observing the scene, couldn't help but think that Derek had shown some capability, but perhaps this was the extent of his abilities. But suddenly, Derek's eyes began to glow, a sight that perplexed and frightened the monster. Seizing the moment, Derek grabbed his sword and declared, You let your guard down. Sorry, but I'm tougher than I look. With a swift strike, he slashed at the monster's stomach eye. However, the red magic power emanating from the monster pushed Derek back forcefully. Derek initiated his regeneration process, remarking, You let your guard down. Sorry, but I'm tougher than I look, as if I'd die from something like that. He readied his sword and declared, Now the real fight starts. The monster activated its flare vortex, and Derek wondered if it was fire. Knowing he couldn't attack the monster at that moment, he prepared to defend. As the monster slashed towards Derek, he managed to block the attack. Feeling trapped against the wall, Derek realized his predicament. Shelley looked on with worry, fearing Derek might truly be in danger this time. 
a powerful slash occurred, but to everyone's surprise, Derek managed to grab the monster's sword with his clawed hand. Oh, you thought you'd won, he exclaimed. With a swift move, he used the monster's own sword to stab its stomach eye, eliciting a growl of pain from the monster. Shelley is perplexed as she observes the situation. The monster seems to have caught Derek, but it's Derek who's causing all the commotion. She wonders what exactly is happening. Red magic energy envelops both Derek and the monster. The monster's sword now emits red flames, partially blinding Derek. Despite this, he releases his grip on the monster's sword and leaps away just before the monster can strike him again. Derek is astonished. You're still not dead yet, just how tough are you? He wonders aloud. From the monster's eyes, red flames burst forth, narrowly missing Derek as he attempts to dodge. He realizes the situation's severity. It's not giving me a chance to counterattack. He thinks, his mind racing. I can keep the damage from the flames down thanks to regeneration, but I'm running out of mana here. I can't take any more hits. He's acutely aware that maintaining regeneration and masquerade simultaneously is becoming increasingly difficult. Yet, he discerns that his opponent too is reaching its limits. Both the monster and Derek lock eyes, their gazes filled with determination and intensity. Derek grits his teeth, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. I have to find an opening, no matter what. He resolves within himself, preparing to seize any opportunity that presents itself. As the monster's flames began to intensify, Derek realized the danger of its expanding reach. Its range is too large, I can't get close enough. He muttered to himself, feeling the urgency of the situation. It knows about my body. I can't take it by surprise anymore. Despite his concern, Derek knew he needed to act strategically. Anyway, I should get away from the wall first. He decided, prioritizing his safety and assessing the situation for any potential openings. Yet, the relentless growth of the monster's flames only heightened Derek's unease. It seems as though it doesn't want to let me go. He observed, recognizing the gravity of the threat before him. As Shelley struggled to stand up, her thoughts raced with concern for Derek's safety. That guy, at this rate, heal. She trailed off, her worry evident. Meanwhile, Guido, determined to take action, seized his bow with a firm grip. I have to do something, he resolved, feeling the weight of the situation. Charging his bow with determination, he muttered, I won't just be rescued by some random bypass. With a focused aim, he released the arrow, but Derek couldn't help but wonder about the archer from earlier. The archer from earlier? Did he miss? He questioned internally. However, to his surprise, the arrow found its mark, striking a mountain and causing a heavy stone to dislodge and plummet towards the monster's head. Derek seized the opportunity as cracks began to spread across the monster's forehead. This is my only chance, he thought, his determination unwavering. With swift precision, he drove his sword into the monster's stomach eye once more. The monster let out a pained growl as it intensified its flames, its agony palpable. Derek, seizing the moment of the monster's vulnerability, resolved to take action. I should have been able to deal some damage, he thought, determined to press his advantage. Despite being unarmed, he activated his claws, knowing he had to make do with what he had. With determination in his eyes, he charged towards the flailing monster, intent on ending its life. With a heavy punch to the monster's stomach, a burst of light erupted, sending the monster crashing to the ground in agony. With a sense of disbelief, Derek pondered if he had indeed triumphed over a level 30 dungeon boss. As the screen displayed his newfound experience points and his level increasing to 21, he realized the significance of his victory. Reflecting on the nature of the dungeon as an alternate dimension fueled by malevolent mana, Derek understood that only the boss could harness the evil energy from the depths below. Now that it lay defeated, not only would the dungeon disaster be averted, but the surrounding area would likely return to its peaceful state as well. As Derek glanced at Guido with one eye, he couldn't help but wonder if his undead form had remained unnoticed. 
Meanwhile, Guido, though acknowledging Derek's life-saving feat, couldn't shake off his curiosity about the mysterious newcomer who single-handedly vanquished a formidable monster beyond their capability. Derek, contemplating his increased levels and newfound strength, couldn't help but see the silver lining in the midst of the dungeon disaster, considering it a stroke of unexpected fortune. With a smile, Derek contemplated his current status. Level 25, HP 47, and magic power at 2, he mused to himself. Evolution should bring monsters closer to their ideal form. Perhaps in my next evolution, I'll become even more human. He felt a sense of anticipation at the prospect of evolving further and perhaps gaining even greater abilities. Shelley intervened, expressing her gratitude. Thank you for saving our lives. My name is Shelley, she said warmly. Derek quickly concealed his stats, not wanting to reveal too much about himself just yet. Shelley asks for his name, but Derek finds himself out of mana. He realizes that he can't maintain his human form much longer because Masquerade, which allows him to temporarily take a human form, consumes 1 MP every 10 minutes. Urgently, he knows he needs to get away from them as soon as possible. He shouts at Shelley and hastily runs off, mentioning that he doesn't have time to waste on something. Shelley is left feeling worried about his sudden departure, while Guido expresses confusion, wondering what could be the matter with Derek. He notes that Derek didn't even take the boss magic stone, which is the proof of ending a dungeon disaster and quite valuable. Shelley expresses her gratitude, noting that Derek's actions show humility in saving them and leaving without even revealing his name. However, Guido remains skeptical, thinking that there must be more to Derek's story. He wonders why Derek was alone in the dungeon and how he recovered from his injuries so quickly. Could it be a skill of his? Frank, now awake and covered in injuries, addresses Guido, expressing his disagreement with Guido's distrustful nature. He acknowledges that Derek came to their aid despite their suspicions, and though he acknowledges Derek's odd circumstances, he believes Derek is not a bad person. Guido, surprised by Frank's awakening, concedes, Yeah, I guess you're right. Guido, plunging his weapon into the monster's eye, focuses on retrieving the magic stone. Meanwhile, Frank observes that extracting a magic stone from a monster of this size requires considerable effort and time. Shelley, expressing concern, questions whether it's appropriate for them to claim the spoils when Derek was the one who defeated the monster. Frank emphasizes the importance of obtaining the magic stone to demonstrate that the dungeon disaster has been resolved. He suggests that they can repay Derek if they encounter him again in the future. Shelley, feeling uncertain, wonders if they will have the opportunity to reunite with Derek someday. Derek takes a moment to catch his breath, reflecting on the close call. He realizes that his use of masquerade was perilously close to revealing his true form to the others. Despite relying heavily on regeneration, he's relieved that he didn't simply flee this time. Derek notes that his level has increased to 25, with his MP now at 36. Derek sits on a stone, contemplating his situation. Masquerade consumes 1 MP every 10 minutes, meaning he can maintain his human form for 6 hours now. With his MP fully recovering in just half a day's rest, he ponders whether he can manage to live as a human if he hides at home. Meanwhile, his sister thinks about him while sleeping, unaware of the challenges he faces. With determination, he clenches his fist. He mentions, It'll also serve as training for my skill, so let's try heading back to human society. The next day, in the capital city of Rayburg, members of the Adventurer's Guild gather, shocked to see the trio. A dungeon disaster in the Western Cave. And you said the boss was defeated already? Are you serious, Frank? Yeah, I'm serious, Frank replied. It was my first time seeing a monster at level 30. If that boss hadn't been defeated, that whole area could have turned into a monster nest. An old man named Arthur, the guild master, entered the scene. That's just too hard to believe, he remarked. Subduing such a monster all by yourselves is not possible. Frank replied, it wasn't us who defeated it, which left Arthur shocked. 
Shelley raised her hand and interjected, Yes, a knight appeared and defeated the boss in an instant. Arthur, now visibly agitated, retorted, Are you saying he took on a level 30 boss monster by himself? He added sarcastically, Well, it is you after all. Your pretty head has always been full of nothing but flowers, so it must be just another delusion. This remark incensed Shelley.